Dietrich Bonhoeffer, C.S. Lewis, Joshua Knoll, Existentialism. Oh my God, I am such a happy little boy right now. Welcome back to My Seminary Life. I'm your host, Brandon Knight, and I'm happy this is going to also be a video release so you can see my guest here already laughing at me. This is the summer of Bonhoeffer. Uh, Each week we're diving into a different writing of the uh, well-beloved German Lutheran theologian from the World War II era. But today we have a little bit of a, well, to quote a famous amusement park ride, it's a small world after all, because while Bonhoeffer is in ministry, there's this other guy, maybe you've heard of him, C.S. Lewis, who's also in ministry. It's kind of weird thinking about how history works, that both of these men would have been in ministry right around the same time. So we're going to sit back and we're going to talk about what both men had to say when it comes to learning during the war. And I already said his name once, and if you're watching the video version of this, you can see his lovely haircutted face here on screen. Joshua Knoll, the fellow uh, C.S. Lewis buff, is here to talk about have this conversation with me josh you are the host of systematic geekology the whole church podcast and i think since the last time you have been here you've added a third show to your lineup because you're insane and a glutton for punishment uh welcome back to the show please tell us a little bit before we get started about dummy for theology Yeah, yeah yeah so um turns out there's a lot of stuff to uh, if you want to like rip off someone else's idea, there's a lot you have to do to make sure you're not actually ripping off their idea, like legally. <laughs> so <laughs> said the I future be, lawyer, <laughs> I couldn't be theology for dummies. So it's that dummy for theology. Um, it's fun. You know, I basically take the best I can of a humble perspective, just looking at different theological debates conversations that's been happening over the last 2000 years in the church and saying okay here's a few different people's positions trying to think through it logically and i do my best not to leave with any answers but i I started doing like at the end we'll do three questions so people can think deeper on the subject themselves okay interesting okay yeah so trying to be as neutral as possible but also not leave everybody hanging (laughs) yeah yeah so instead of just being like that's it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, think, think about uh i think what it was like the last time was um because we we're thinking about how god created what does that created mean and going okay. back through you know the, it's not like evolution happened and all of a sudden we started saying oh maybe it's an allegory we've literally been debating whether it was an allegory for the last two thousand years for a going long back time to yeah. augustine yeah um and, and i think at the end one of the three questions i left that i think really important regardless of what side you're on how does your view of what created mean interact with the doctrine of original sin. Does it disprove original Mm. sin? Does it add to original sin? You know, I I think everybody has to wrestle that with that on some level. So even if I don't give you an answer, I feel like hopefully I'm able to show you the implications of those two things and help everybody wrestle with stuff on their own time. Cause I don't have all the answers. I'm just a dummy. (laughs) I'm just a dummy. I love how parody (laughs) laws work. All you had to do was flip the order of the words and everything was fine. Even the logo is <laughs> I had very to, heavily influenced. For the logo, I had to change the shape of his head. Um, I couldn't okay. have, for some reason, I couldn't have the banner going the same angle and direction. So I had to like flip it to a different okay. thing. Yeah. I had to make some stuff where it's like distinctly not the same, but also still recognizable, if that makes sense. Not too many people know this because no one's ever asked, but My Seminary Life is actually an homage to the name My Seminary Life, not the concept of the show, but the name is an homage to my favorite band. No one's ever asked. No one's ever. Yeah. Are you going to tell us what it is? My Chemical Romance. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. I thought I thought so, but I was like, (laughs) yeah, when I bring it. Yeah, it's kind of like, oh, my. And then it's three words. I can figure this out. And Brandon's a almost 30-year-old emo kid. So yeah, I can figure this out. But yeah, it's never come up before. But you know what? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. I want to know. What did I I see? I'm not sure how this is related to my chemical romance. But did you see um, Taylor Swift's new album? 
came out yesterday, and apparently one it of the songs from the Boy. Boy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You knew I was going to say Fallout Boy. <laughs> I've yeah, listened I, to it. Yeah. I haven't either. Shockingly, because my wife is a huge Swifty, uh, she's probably been listening to it in the car. Uh, yeah. Fallout Boy also just released a cover of Billy Joel's "We Didn't Start the Fire," but it's from 1989 to the present, Ooh. and Ooh. it's oh. There was like Wild. a 24 hour period of time where anytime I started to feel depressed, I would put it on and it made me better. <laughs> Man, that that sounds good. But it was. Yeah, also, <laughs> TJ had tickets to a Fallout Boy concert in Charlotte mm. and his cousin had the audacity to decide to get married that day. <laughs> oh, 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 the audacity. <laughs> I They keep playing Wrigley, but the tickets are really expensive. Anyway. Let's get on with uh, what we're talking about here today. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, C.S. Lewis. How about we provide, I'm going to provide a little bit of historical context, and then uh, we'll talk about what these guys have both said when it comes to being a student during World War I. So let's set the stage. This has become one of my favorite parts of this series is setting the historical stage. So first with Bonhoeffer, these conversations are not happening in real time at the exact same time. But there is a lot of parallelisms going on. So first we have Bonhoeffer. The year is 1933. And on last week's episode, we talked a lot about 1933. Josh, at the recording of this episode, you haven't heard this episode, this part yet. But so you get a little bit of a spoiler now. So 1933 Perfect. is a big turning point in Germany. In January, uh, Adolf Hitler is declared chancellor. The Aryan paragraph is passed, which removes all non-Aryan, specifically Jewish people, from holding civil office positions. In the summer, the Reich Church and a few other groups are starting to push in their churches and in, into their synods um, a religious version of the Aryan paragraph, which removes people of non-Aryan and Jewish and Jewish people specifically from the congregation removes it removes them from ministry if they are holding a pastoral position and prevents them from going to seminary. And in last week's episode, we talked about it's fall of 1933, early it's September, and Bonhoeffer gives his response to all of this. Now. At the exact same time, it's still fall 1933, as we are going to have this conversation with Bonhoeffer. He is feeling very um, overwhelmed. He is feeling burnt out. He is feeling discouraged. He doesn't think that what he is doing is actually making a difference in Germany at the time. So he decides to resign from his teaching position, teaching systematic theology at, at a university in Berlin. He's been doing that for about two years now. He decides to resign from this position and to take on being the pastor of not one, not three, but two chur German speaking churches in, uh, well, out, just outside of London. So that's the historical stage of where we're at with Bonhoeffer right now. What we're going to talk about is basically his farewell address to his students before he goes off to be a pastor. Now we hit the fast forward button and the year is now 1939. We go forward six years. 1939, fall time. World War II has officially begun now. September, I think it was the end of September. World War II has officially begun now. And also during the fall time, C.S. Lewis is standing in, let me make sure I get this church, he is preaching at St. Mary the Virgin Church in Oxford. And this is one of the uh, college churches, university churches there. So he is also speaking to a large group of university students here at the beginning of the war. So Josh, the first question I want to ask you in light of this historical context, before we get into what both men had to say specifically. This is a small part of the story, small part of the context, but I think it's interesting, so I want to talk about this a little bit. Bonhoeffer is feeling burnt out, overwhelmed, and discouraged. And his solution is, I'm going to resign from teaching, 
but I'm going to go be a pastor of two churches at the same time. That's not how we do things now when people get discouraged and burnt out in ministry. What do you think about that? What do you think of this idea of like, he's going to step back from this thing, but take on so much more over here in a different, even in a completely different area. He's going from Berlin to just outside of London. Without offending anybody, I think part of why we don't see this is because of a lot of our pastoring in American evangelical churches is teaching. So yeah, we just get more burned out by doing it. A lot of pastoring in other contexts, especially if we're thinking like Lutheran context, is a lot of dealing the sacraments, being with other people, focusing on the community more than just teaching 40 minutes, you know, really mm-hmm. the the homily is usually like what 15 minutes i think so yeah and it's usually a lot more uplifting and about the scripture and not breaking down the etymology of every word and all that not that that's a bad thing it's just kind of a i i could see where pastoring in that context might be more comforting you know might be better for your Mm -hmm. soul than teaching i could see that i could also see i think a lot of times when we hear about burnout here in very modern American churches, it's not just burnout, it's also disgruntlement. You get to this point of like, what is the point of any of this? And Bonhoeffer was there a little bit. He did not see exactly like what being a uh, university professor teaching systematic theology, what that was really assisting at the time with all the changes that are taking place in Germany. But he must have not have been completely disgruntled if he's willing to take Mm -hmm. on two German-speaking churches over here in London. And location probably did matter quite a bit, too. Um, As someone who went to a church that talked about politics every week, that then moved to a church that was not mentioning politics and talking about the gospel, man, that was such a comfort for me. Mm. I could see, given the context, preaching in Berlin, where, you know, it's not like Hitler was an atheist. You know, he mm-hmm. used just war theory. Um, I'd argue Aquinas's version, which is why if we didn't have Aquinas, you know, yeah, maybe things would be a little bit different. I don't know. But <laughs> just say Aquinas. <laughs> I don't Always care if you <laughs> I don't care if you're if, if you're not an Aquinas. if you're not into him, it's fine. <laughs> just say his name right. <laughs> I, I think Thomas Aquinas is additions to just war theory is kind of what he okay. used to justify, even though I think he took it out of context. So leave that sure. alone. Aquinas is not to blame for World War II. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Hopefully not. Um, but I am saying some of that bad theology definitely infiltrated Hitler's teaching. And then you insert Bonhoeffer, someone who's well thought, and hopefully other people can relate to this. If, you, if you've spent a lot of time thinking about something and understand the nuance of something and you enter a situation where someone just goes, no, gas is high, that means this is bad. And that's literally their whole extent of thinking about it. You're like, ah, true. That's just exhausting. Trying to talk to people like that day in and mm-hmm. day out. Mm-mm. Nope. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. that is. Yeah, I've done something like that before, too, of just like, it's like talking to a brick wall. <laughs> Yeah, truly. And, I, and I, I really have a hard time with that. That That is part of the reason why um, I am s- slowly myself moving away from this idea of being the pastor of a church at this stage of my life and looking more towards the academic world. My wife just came home from her Bible study last night and just telling me about some of this stuff that people believe. And it's like, how? How did you get to these conclusions? And there is this part of me, and this is part of the reason why I don't think I'm quite there yet spiritually to be a pastor, where I don't want to deal with it. You know, when you're a pastor, (laughs) you have to correct these things. But the difference is that, at least with the academic world, you're still shaping minds, even at the college, university, seminary level. Yes, I went to college with some guys who were very like in their ways about Calvinism, Mm -hmm. but you know, you are shaping minds still. These are people who have been thinking these very unique, we'll put it that way, things for years and years to deconstruct and reconstruct that isn't, 
it, it doesn't matter how good of a preacher you are. It doesn't matter how much community time you spend with a person. Another big factor is them being humbly willing to admit, yeah, I'm majorly off base about this thing. Yeah, I am um, also. <laughs> this is my last my last bullet point on reasons why. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> this could be his his way to get away from burnout. I'm just kind of thinking like global context, not good or bad thing. Everybody has different things that ail them. But hearing theologians from other parts of the world and how they're genuinely shocked that American Christianity, like the big conversations we're having, still have a lot to do with like evolution or inerrancy. And they're like, we don't even talk about that. <laughs> so I could see. I like, honestly, I could see where like someone Mm -hmm. over here who's just tired of hearing that all the time goes to one of those circles and does the exact same thing or more work. And it's like still easier because you're not dealing with the stuff that, you know, I feel like burnout can be really specific or on the flip side, maybe someone over there has been really trying to drill people on inerrancy and just no one cares. And all of a sudden Mm -hmm. comes over here and people are willing to hear what he has to say. Yeah, that can be a relief. I like that. I like that a lot. Obviously, it is also worth saying that, and we'll move on from after this point, of we do really like here in America self-care, both culturally and in the church. I do believe that rest is significant and rest is very biblical. If you would like more on that, we did an entire series about keeping the Sabbath back at the beginning of this year, which feels like forever ago. So rest and self-care does have a place especially Mm -hmm. in ministry where you are taking care of other people physically and spiritually but it is an easy idol for us because we like comfort we like comfort in america yeah i am absolutely not positing this as one of his reasons because i don't know Mm -hmm. enough about bon haffer to be like maybe he also has adhd because i hate when people do that kind of stuff (laughs) sure uh, yes. So just speaking only from my own context, I know like in school, and it's just so hard to get people to understand this. Mm-hmm. When all I was doing was school, it was impossible for me to do school well. <laughs> I had okay. to wait get to the point where I'm like working overtime every single week and taking extra hours. Like I had to have like a ton going on for me to actually do school well. Just because like, I need more stuff to like keep me level, if that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. That's why he has three that's podcasts. That's not everybody. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's exactly. also not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some people, they need the rest. And then I feel like there are the people like me who, yeah, I still need rest. I'm not saying I don't need rest. I'm sure. saying like, I think we have this tendency of putting our needs onto everybody else and then be like, oh, no, you mm-hmm. have to do this. And sometimes that actually makes it worse for the person. <laughs> sure. Yes. Yeah. So again, going back now to Lewis and Bonhoeffer, again, these conversations are not happening at the same time. There's actually a six-year gap, an entire different location that both of these are taking place in. It is also worth noting that Bonhoeffer isn't completely abandoning ship on Germany. He will be back. We will be talking more about Bonhoeffer's return actually just next week on the show. He's already going to be back in Germany. But we're talking about two different time frames, but there's a very interesting parallelism going on here of Bonhoeffer is addressing his systematic theology students, seeing the writing on the wall of what is coming. And Lewis, six years later, is seeing the writing on the wall fulfilled and is also dealing with the same overarching question of what do we do now? What do we do when we see the writing on the wall? What do we see? What do we do when it's come to pass? Josh, what do we have you ever had to stand in the gap like that before? Because I cannot even imagine. No. <laughs> I I will use one of those phrases that we are so tired of hearing of. <laughs> of it was unprecedented times to some degree of what was going on. And they have to stand before their students and try to make sense of it. That is quite the burden to bear. Yeah. Um. Obviously, we haven't been through anything like that. But, you know, just thinking of our generation as a whole, we've just went through one of the world's worst pandemics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we we are currently seeing 
a huge war going on in Ukraine that could mm-hmm. end up being much bigger, you know, coming, I'm coming into life near the end of the Cold War kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. um, 9-11. We, yeah, tons of stuff happened in our lifetimes, um, what, which is one of the things that made Lewis's writing shocking and interesting to me mm. is how he early on, he kind of just makes the statement of, yeah, these are unprecedented times. Everybody always thinks that they're in unprecedented times. <laughs> I was like, yeah, dude, you were in both wars. You can't say that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Bonhoeffer was born. I think he I don't know. I think he was born like right at the end of World War One, but grew up during the in-between period with the Treaty of Versailles and its effect on Germany. Um, yeah. But yeah, Lewis does have in his little sermon this very interesting like, yes, we're in unprecedented times. Also, people die all the time. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that <laughs> I have like near the end of his his thing that really I was like, oh, <laughs> he goes, yeah, the uh, the rate of death hasn't increased or decreased at all. 100 percent of people still die. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, I guess you're not wrong, but <laughs> that that would not wow. have gone over well in 2020. <laughs> that's for sure. No, no. And, that, and that's the thing. Like, I would love 40 years from now. For someone to do a comparison of like who ends up being our top theologians, you know, and comparing oh that to what like Bonhoeffer and Lewis said in that time. Uh-huh. Because, yeah, people were dying left and right throughout the pandemic. It wasn't war, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but we were, you know, I think I had four family members pass away or something. Like, I had at least one. It wasn't yeah. like, yeah, like it's not like we weren't affected by this. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Yes. It was, I just, I can't imagine. It was hard enough, you know, I kind of stood in the gap for my wife who was having anxiety problems during 2020, but I can't imagine trying to be like the voice of reason for these people, for these students. Bonhoeffer, he's, he's addressing his systematic theology class and he's kind of got two big things is what he's talking about here. The first big thing that he talks about is how... He doesn't understand how people can go through university, do their studying, get into their ministry, and then say, all that theology stuff, yeah, that doesn't matter. We gotta per- we gotta focus on the we gotta focus on the pragmatic stuff here, which does come up with C.S. Lewis as well. I, I, arguably, that's like the big part of C.S. Lewis's sermon is this whole abandoning of your academic studies to pursue something else. Josh, do we still have a problem today with people getting out of the university, getting out of seminary and saying all that theology stuff? Yeah, that's not what matters. What matters is trying to help people understand that liberal woke people are ruining everything or helping people understand that racism is bad and you're all a bunch of racists. Yeah, I think... (sighs) I think everyone's always most critical of their own time. So sure. Take that with a grain of salt, but it seems as though what Lewis and Bonhoeffer were talking about was more people went to school and then started preaching and realizing they cared more about doing the pragmatic helping people stuff, Mm -hmm. which to an extent to me seems justifiable. Like I can actually see the, no, no, no. It's actually all about helping people. Sure. Today, it seems more as though, and to be the annoying guy, to blame that on social media, but we'll be sharing this, <laughs> <laughs> is um, it, it seems a lot like more of a, they went to theology school, they did all this, and people maybe even start preaching really well at first, and then realize, mm-hmm. oh, wait a minute, when I said this thing about not liking the LGBTQ community, or not liking this, or being angry mm-hmm. about wokeism, I got more views, I got more people to like it, and then I think people slowly start justifying including more and more of that until they're only about that. Yeah. We're all slaves to the algorithm at some point. Yeah. Which reminds me, please leave a five star review. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And subscribe <laughs> and subscribe, subscribe and enable notifications. So always on. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, we, I really wish neither one of these guys would have lived to this point just based off of natural causes, you know, but man, just to think, what these guys would have said about some of the stuff that goes on now. 
particularly as you're saying with our enslavement to social media and the algorithm mm-hmm. and just that whole hot takes those get more clicks those get more you know it's those and i i really think it's unhealthy i really do yeah. to always be in a state of readiness to fire off with an opinion and to be spicy about it that's not healthy i know i know the bible there are times when paul is getting in the face of peter paul is writing sharply to the church in corinth but gosh dang it it's not part of the fruit of the spirit yeah it's, i um <laughs> go on i was gonna say i i what I am okay and not okay with. And mm-hmm. also, I'm, I'm kind of curious if either of these people would have even wrote if they lived in this time. Like, I could see where Lewis would be like, I don't even want to be in writing. <laughs> like, He's joined. Oh, my gosh. People. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine Tolkien with all of the no, technology? I was going to say, he, he would still have wrote. It would have just been long books and why we're all awful. <laughs> he probably would have become friends with Alan Moore by this point. Anyway, go Man. on. Man, Lord of the Rings would have just been really morbid. <laughs> <laughs> go on the the thing that i'm okay with and that this is this is being the annoying i'm a podcast producer meh, 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 meh. i'm not gonna do all that but <laughs> i um i'm okay with and this is gonna I'm, maybe i'll sound a lot more like my uh <laughs> i said jesus professor but i am okay with people who lay out a message, whether it's Bible or whatever, you say what you want to say, and then maybe tailor your title or your show notes or whatever. Like you look it up on Google Trends, all that other stuff to SEO figure out. and all that. Yeah, yeah. How to get people interested in what you said. What I what I think is yeah. distasteful that these people would have a problem with that everyone should have a problem mm-hmm. with is when you start with that. You start going through Google mm-hmm. Trends and seeing what the big topics are and then decide you're going to talk about that. That's what yeah. I'm like, oh, that's gross. Yeah. And that's you know, this is part of the issue that Bonhoeffer is trying to address with his students is you can't actually take on heresy and identify it and be able to speak against it if you don't know your Bible. Like that's I it blows me away because we have this idea of like Bonhoeffer, super intellectual guy, which he is, but so much of what he has to say is do you read your Bible? Haven't you ever been to Sunday school? Do do you know the gospel? Okay, stand on that. Stand on those things. He talks about here, it's really short. I only wrote like a page of notes. Normally I write like two or three pages worth of notes. Um, But he writes, what you need to do is know your Bible. Know the confessions. Study the church fathers. And obviously he brings up Martin Luther, but he also name drops Augustine and the official theologian of the whole church podcast, St. Thomas Aquinas, or whatever you say, Aquinas. Um, And he also (laughs) brings up a very important fourth category, and that is dialoguing with people. Have conversations with people about theology, about the Word of God, about Scripture. Josh, how important is dialoguing to grow in our faith? Very. <laughs> Next question, please. Yeah, TJ, TJ answer. I um, I, I I think it's fascinating how often on the whole church podcast that we interview people and everybody who hears we're going to interview be like, oh, you have to ask them this because they believe this and you can do it. This gets you question and all this other stuff. And hmm. TJ and I, be being who we are, we'll still ask them the questions, but not as gotcha question. We're like, someone says you believe this, so. How do you answer blonde? They'll be like, you don't believe that. <laughs> you know, and it's just so funny because it's like so many people were like, oh, we got to listen to the first Catholic episode you did because that's so exciting because how how do they explain that the Christians, if they still worship Mary and they worship all the saints, it's like, well, they start by saying that they don't worship those things. <laughs> <laughs> For starters, they don't. That's yeah. actually what um, – and this the audio version of this is going to come out in the end of August. That's what my um, – live episode during the every tribe denomination and tongue episode or uh, conference essentially was was us sitting down and running over frequently assumed things about other denominations because we actually had a pretty 
diverse group of people there. So I could ask Christian Ashley from the Let Nothing Move You podcast, hey, you go to a Southern Baptist school, so that means you think we all should vote Republican if we're a Christian, right? And he could explain his answer, yes or no. Spoiler, it's a no. But... um. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I agree with you of it's important. It's very important. And I I had teased in last week's episode that there was a big announcement for this episode. Josh, would you like a big announcement, some insider information? I love big announcements. I know you do. So I've been sitting on this idea for a while and reading this put it in my head of like, okay, yeah. I need to do this for sure. Drum roll. One of my favorite memories from college was dialoguing with my classmates in class, on our way to a cafe, walking to the cafeteria, super late at night. You've had these conversations, I imagine, that it's like, it's just rich. It's life, it's theology, it's philosophy, it's it's everything, right? And we're just exploring and talking. Online seminary does not do a good job trying to recreate that forum posts are basically really bland Facebook posting and comments. They're not that interesting. And I wanted that back because I agree with Bonhoeffer and I agree with you. We need to have these dialogues in order to grow. And so ending this year, starting in November to end 2023, The series we're going to close on is called Dialogues. The reason why My Seminary Life is primarily a solo show is because it was just super pragmatic at first when I started it. It's my homework. I'm just going to talk about it. And over time, it's become more like this of like, okay, I know some people who can really weigh in on a conversation. I'll bring them in. But we're going to close out this year, and my plan is to bring back over and over again throughout the year, throughout the years, this series where it's going to be nothing but guests. I know, revolutionary, a podcast that just interviews people. And it's <laughs> going to be, it's revolutionary. So much easier. Here. I don't know. I hope so. Um, and it, I have this book, it's called The 50 Most Important Bible Questions by Dr. Michael Raldenick. And on each Ooh. episode, me and that person, we're going to sit down. And I'm just going to go through the questions. I'm not going to read the answers that Ralph Denick provides ahead of time. I'm going to read them later on my own. But we're just going to go through these questions and we're going to talk about it. And we're going to get through as many as we can. And yes, you're invited. Don't worry. I'm going to bring back as many of the... There's actually one very specific section that I want to talk with you about. Because I think part of your story might fit into this section. That sounds fun. Also, can I just specifically do question 42? If there is a question 42. Yeah. Well, yeah, it does. It's 50 most important Bible questions. Yes, I will circle question 42 and we will start with that one. I don't care what it is. <laughs> I'll, I'll look. I, I will go look as soon as we're done because now I'm curious. I kind of hope it's something that's like super not relevant to me at all. Like I have no qualifications hope so too. to talk about. I yeah. hope so too. What like, would... I just the question 42 so I can say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's the meaning to life. Josh, this has nothing to do with marriage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so see as Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's the big announcement. That's what we're going to be finishing the year up with is this dialogues. And it's going to become a normal part of my seminary life moving forward because we need to have these conversations and we need yeah. to wrestle and get different perspective on things. So True. yeah. True. Let's move forward now. That's because that's basically all Bonhoeffer has to say. Bonhoeffer is like, keep studying. Don't give up studying theology. Here's different ways that you can keep studying theology. We now move forward to C.S. Lewis. To me, Lewis is dealing with a much more existential issue. He's dealing with a lot of angst, a lot of anxiety, and a lot of dread. Because there's these, there's this idea of like, why would I study mathematics if they're just going to drop a bomb on my head? 
Or why should I continue to study mathematics when there's people dying and going to hell? Doesn't it matter more that I'm out there saving people's souls right now? And these are the two big questions that Lewis is wrestling with. Walk us through this, Josh. What is How does Lewis walk through these questions? I gotta say, I kind of wish, well, part of me wishes I knew ahead of time that that's kind of what was going on here. Because mm. I, I decided to read it with zero context. <laughs> <laughs> so in my head, I was like, I'm expecting him to be like, oh, guys, we really got to be urgent because life could end at any second. And instead, he's like, shockingly calm voice. Yes. Like, like truly shocking. Too. Like, he starts off and he's like, you know, people think that in war and, you know, Christianity, all kinds of stuff, you, th- you think that it's going to completely change everything. That everyone's really shocked how it doesn't change much. And I'm like, excuse me, dude, you were you were on like, you were in the pits. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> right. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. Uh, turns out when you're fighting, uh, eventually, you know, you start off, you're worried about your life, you're doing all this other stuff. And eventually you really, you find yourself reading books. You find yourself caring about the arts mm-hmm. while you're in war. And he basically just makes this argument of like, that's just what human nature is. We're, we're always faced with impending doom. And mm-hmm. we always end up going to these places and kind of, he's like, basically, that's what na- human nature is. That's what we're made to be. So we need to lean into it. It's like how he kind of starts. And I was like, do what? Say what now? <laughs> like, <laughs> don't you mean we're all good at doom? So we should all just do theology and care about God? <laughs> He's like, mm-hmm. nope, the arts are important. I was like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, um, that was very interesting because he talks about when he served in World War One. the closer you yeah. got to the front of the line, the less they talked about the war and wanted to talk about anything else. And yeah, during yeah. the pandemic, probably some people spent a little too much time on Netflix, but it almost was like, yeah, you watch Star Wars normally. Sure. Watch Star Wars. You got to stay home anyway. Yeah. He makes the statement of there is no normal time. And I was like, oh, <laughs> They're then, always yeah, thinking unprecedented. About- <laughs> it's so funny because like I'm thinking back on my own life and I'm like, I guess that has literally been true my whole life. And I guess it just would make sense to assume it's been true for everyone's life. Like we always think that at some point there was a normal, but mm-hmm. it had to be, you know, before 9-11 because that's when we were all up in arms about. Uh, then it's like, oh, wait, actually before 9-11 was Cold Wars and then Afghanistan and then after 9-11 we're mm-hmm. all about Iraq and then it's COVID. And then it's like, it's like oh, I guess there's. Yeah, we've never had like a normal time hasn't been a thing. There's a whole recession at some point in between all that. Yeah, 2008. Yeah. Yeah, So that really puts the whole this is the new normal into a very philosophical new light. Like that's not that's a construct that doesn't normal just doesn't exist. (laughs) It doesn't exist. And yet it is always new still at the same time. It's very peculiar. And honestly, I, I think that that bit alone is really humbling. Because like we like to think, oh yes, millennials, we've gone through you know terrorist attacks, sure. world wars, pandemic, and like you know you see those memes on Facebook all the time. Mm-hmm. It's like um, here's a guy who fought in both world wars, saying that there's no such thing as normal time. <laughs> like, right. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so there's that. <laughs> he he does this thing. He's talking about um, like he, I I love when he does his like little metaphor story things. Those always mm-hmm. stick with me for some reason. He, he talks about. If you lived like near the shore at a place that flooded constantly, perhaps Mm -hmm. the same thing to do would be because you have a duty to save other people's lives. So you so you learn how to swim. You learn how to save Mm -hmm. a person's life. You basically you become a lifeguard because if you live there, that makes sense to do. Because what doesn't make sense then is that's all you do. You're constantly worried about it, constantly thinking, constantly Mm -hmm. going down the beach looking for it because that that would make you a monomaniac. And that's a cool word. Basically, it's all consuming. Yeah, that's I wrote it down. And it was so funny because he makes this distinction of what is worth living for and what is worth dying for. Do you think that also speaks to what we were talking about earlier about hot takes? Yes. <laughs> yes. And it, to me, it just, it screamed Christian nationalism the whole time. <laughs> mm. Because what do you mean by he, that? Even, so when he makes this distinction of like, what's worth living for and worth dying for, he says like, it was worth dying to save someone's life. If you live in that town. You go out, mm-hmm. you save the other person's life. That's worth it. It's not worth having your entire life consumed, worried about saving someone at some point. Mm. And he then he he brings that and he says politics, which he includes military service as politics, which makes yes. perfect sense. Sure. <laughs> he says, 
that's something worth dying for, but not worth living for. Yes. Once you're obsessed with it and it's consumed your life, you know, you know I, I don't think he uses the word idol, but that's what it really felt like to me is like, he was basically saying mm-hmm. that's become your God more or less. Mm-hmm. It's not worth that. It's worth dying for your country. He says, I agree. You know, it's worth dying for these things, but it's not necessarily worth living for these things. And that's yes. where he then spins it to our religion, our faith and goes, that's what we live for. And then he even says that it doesn't change your life, but rather it doesn't, completely change it you don't become a whole new thing you don't like suddenly don't care about marvel and now you <laughs> care right. about dc yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he what was the word he uses reorganize it reorganizes mm. your life reprioritizes how you do things and um he even does you know we do all things through christ or one, one of the verses like that that always get used mm-hmm. out of context but he uses it as like a yeah no we live our lives in this context we live for this we might die for our country we might die for our politics we never die <laughs> you know, when mm-hmm. it comes to our own faith, like we, we, that doesn't happen. We live for that. Mm-hmm. And I like that distinction. I thought that was really powerful, especially given the context. Yes. Especially given the context, it is very fascinating. It's like when it does go back to that, when a good thing becomes an ultimate thing, that's when it becomes a bad thing, you know? And mm-hmm. it's like, you can have the most noble of purposes for being against Christian nationalism, since you brought that up earlier. Like, you could have the most noble of reasons to speak out against that dominionism, all of the things associated with Christian nationalism. But when it's like the sole motivator of what you are doing, that's you're in sin. It's become your idol. And boy, that is just such like like a gut check. Like I literally feel that of like, man, where am I doing that? Of like, this is just an all consuming thing over living for Christ. Yeah. And for me, Lewis kind of gives us a little bit of whiplash in this. Cause he keeps okay. going like, like first I'm shocked that he's like, eh, it's just like every other time. And then I get shocked that he drops this, like worth dying for worth living for thing. And then it just kind of mm-hmm. seems like, to me, it felt like out of nowhere. Next thing you know, he's talking about why we need knowledge, why we need universities. Mm-hmm. And he he makes the statement where he's like, perhaps if everybody was Christians, we wouldn't need knowledge at all. We could just all be simpletons and be happy. <laughs> I was True. Like, oh. I was, that was a shocking thing for you to say also, because right. I, I, I am of the opinion that kind of like one of the ways we worship God is with our minds. And I don't think he'd disagree. Mm-hmm. I don't think that was his point. But um, basically, I mean, Lewis was well educated. Yes, Granted, that was before fair. his conversion, but it also played a factor in yeah. his conversion. <laughs> also, just a side note, I wish I could be educated the way he was. <laughs> University doesn't really pan out, so I'm just going to do mentorship <laughs> specifically with someone. Like, I wish I could do that. Like, yeah, yeah that'd be great for the, ADHD folk. <laughs> the C.S. Lewis Institute does offer something similar to that. I've looked into it before. I'm just not in that phase of life to be able to commit to something like that right now. But they do have something similar. Or I could just yeah. do my own thing at my own church. That there's there's that too. <laughs> yeah. True. True. But he he basically he makes the claim that our need for knowledge is defense against knowledge from I forget if he says heathens or what he he uses some word that I was like wow that's a dated word <laughs> basically okay. knowledge from, from bad theologians or people who okay. are very anti Christian so we need knowledge okay. to defend us from that and then also against mysticism oh yeah mm. interesting. I kind of, what's funny is like, even in church today, I like, you definitely still see like some place where I'm like, that's bad theology. Mm-hmm. That's not what the Bible says. And mm-hmm. you know, people just don't know because they don't bother reading. Go back to that Bonhoeffer, read your Bible bit. <laughs> right, right. Just and read you your get, Bible. <laughs> and then, you know, you know, I grew up charismatic, so like in a mm-hmm. Pentecostal church. So I definitely see the mysticism as a danger too. I'm like, okay, yeah. As yeah. much as I still like emphasis of the spirit, spiritual gifts, all that. I'm like, yeah, we safeguard ourselves is a good idea yes yeah. there is there is still a safeguarding i think there is room in certain contexts for more mysticism i think there's a difference between the show of a non-denominational church the lights the sounds the smoke machine versus like true mysticism but i I agree i agree with you we still have to safeguard ourselves from that we have to safeguard ourselves even from just rigorous 
academic studying all the time. I mean, that's even in Ecclesiastes. Like even the preacher figured that one out of like much studying is a weariness to us to the soul. So like yeah. yeah, we have to go back to like what are we living for? We live for Jesus. Yeah. And what are you dying for? Making those distinctions, mm-hmm. like that's gonna stick with me. But the uh <laughs> <laughs> I think what in true Baptist fashion he gets through okay. like three fourths of his sermon or whatever, and then he goes. So here's my three points. <laughs> he does. Three he does do that. Doesn't that you need he? to defend your, the scholar in wartime. He needs to defend themselves against. <laughs> I was like, is Lewis doing a three point sermon right now? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? You're Anglican. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I just thought it was funny, but uh, he goes. Um, the three things is thinking too much on politics or nationalism, going back to the mm-hmm. Christian nationalist things, like that's one thing the scholar has to worry about. Thinking too much on that mm-hmm. and not enough on, you know, theology, on arts, those kind of things. Um, mm-hmm. Frustration, feeling like there's a lack of time. That's where we get that whole 100% of people die. You might die younger, mm-hmm. are we really? But he he asserts that that's not really what we're concerned about is less time because he's like, you're equal. You could say you're concerned about having a painful death. You're less likely to have a painful death in war. <laughs> You're mm-hmm. more likely to just instantly die. <laughs> right. It, it's funny that he just kind of throws that out there, but then he, he kind of uses that to say what we're really afraid of. And that's the third point was fear. So you get frustration for lack of time. Thank you too much on politics. And then fear was his third mm-hmm. one. And it's where he, he ends it where he basically, he makes the assertion that what actually happens. And he says, theologians before him would probably even say some of this is a good thing. Death becomes more real. And that's where mm-hmm. our times post COVID really relates to what Bonhoeffer mm-hmm. and Lewis says a lot of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're a lot more familiar with death than we were a few years ago. True. True. We even have the reality, maybe not on our own doorstep, but in the news with the war in Ukraine as well, of just this constant reminder of death's reality. One thing. Yeah. One other thing that stood out to me from Lewis was there was this bit in there where he does one of my favorite things of breaking down the wall of the sacred versus the secular. Yeah, that that, that's one of my big things, says the guy who enjoys the music of you two, um, (laughs) that we we oftentimes do build up this wall, this division. And this was part of the issue that students were having was like, there is more value in saving souls than in doing schoolwork. And Lewis points out, you can do your schoolwork to the Lord. That is an option. You can worship God through the pursuit of the arts. You can worship God through intellectual pursuits that is still worshiping him just as much as saving souls is. It's all when you become a Christian, <clears throat> you're a Christian now. So you, the things that you do, you do unto the Lord. That includes even the most mundane of tasks, like going grocery shopping. You can do that unto the Lord. You should be doing that unto the Lord because you're a Christian. Now you're following Jesus. Yeah. I, um, that was part of the, like, what's it mean to die for something or live for something? Right. And yeah, I, I can't remember what the, what the comparison he made was, but he was like, I'm not trying to say it's just as good for someone to, I just kind of, sometimes when I don't know what he's talking about, I just fill in my own blanks. <laughs> so it was, it's, he, he was basically saying it's, he wasn't equating picking up your trash being just as worth mm-hmm. your time as learning calc three or something, you know, like he's sure. like, yeah, I'm yeah. not saying all things are equal. I'm saying that all things are important. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, so I thought that was a cool distinction, too. I do like that. All things are important. So yeah, so what we have here with Bonhoeffer and Lewis, maybe trying to tie a big thread over yeah. it over it all. <laughs> Keep on studying. Mic drop, we're <laughs> out of here. But really, like for Bonhoeffer, seeing the writing on the walls, his big thing for his students were, guys, gals, you cannot stop studying theology you need to keep studying you need to be in the word you need to be talking to each other discipleship and for lewis it was don't forsake these things there's not a divide between the sacred and the secular what matters in this time that's not unprecedented there is no new normal people die all the time 
what we need to do is do our work, whatever that may Uh look like, our studies, our stay at home parenting, whatever that may look like. We need to be doing these things unto the Lord in all seasons. It is how we live and how we die. Yeah. And and I think one of the big takeaways too was we're not just living knowing we're going to die soon. Like that's not Mm -hmm. what we should take away. I think it's what Lewis is getting at and perhaps Bonhoeffer is more Mm -hmm. of this we need to live fully while we're here, you know, um, mm-hmm. basically saying YOLO without saying YOLO. Cause eh. yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's, especially with Bonhoeffer seeing how he was leaving Berlin. <clears throat> I could see how some of his students would take that as a abandoned ship. Yeah. We're all, we're going to hell in a handbasket. It's over. And he's, both of them are trying to reassure their students. Hey, yeah. keep on. Live yeah. for the Lord. Also, to plug my my new podcast again. <laughs> sure. Go ahead. I, for my own entertainment's sake, I just mm. need your listeners to know that I, I stole yes. the keep on studying and changed yeah, it to I keep know. on struggling. Keep on struggling. And on that note, it's time for my favorite part, the part oh, where I man. struggle through the ending of every podcast, whether it's this show or Systematic Geekology. Seriously, go back and listen to some of the older ones. I butchered the closing line all the time. Let's go ahead and start wrapping this episode up. Uh, Josh and myself, all of our shows are a part of the network that Josh has launched uh, earlier this spring, early summer, uh, the Anzal Ministries Podcast Network. Here you can check out all three of Josh's shows, Sysmatic uh, Ecology, Whole Church, Dummy for Theology, My Seminary Life is there. You can catch uh, Let Nothing Move You, The Bible After Hours, mm-hmm. right? That's what that yeah, one's called, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And the one coming this month, I believe, that I'm really excited oh. for, TJ's okay. launching another one. Uh, hockey night in the Carolinas. Is that, that is that finally coming? All right. I know. He, that'll be the fun. The logo looks cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I'm excited to see that. Good for him. Get a little bit of a, yeah. a unique flair <laughs> in there. Uh, so you can catch all of those shows. And if you're a hockey fan, you got one for you now, too. Uh, you can catch all those shows on the Anatol Ministries podcast network. Um, Amp. It's all about Christians wrestling with the bigger questions, even if it does sound like a youth group name. You can go into the description of this episode to find a link (laughs) to the Amp feed on Spotify where all of the shows just automatically pop up. You can also find links to the MSL website and shop. Follow the show on Facebook and Instagram at My Seminary Life Pod. And if you really, like really like really like this show you really enjoyed this episode i know a lot of you are really enjoying this summer of bonhoeffer and you want to express that please rate and review the show wherever you are listening and consider heading on over to buymeacoffee.com slash msl pod buy me a virtual cup of coffee for three dollars or subscribe to the my seminary life fan club for nine dollars a month get access to exclusive posts like finding out ahead of time what's coming out on the show the august post just went up this week or or and also and also you get a shout out here on the show as well is there option to do more than three dollars on buy you You can uh so how it works with buy me a coffee is that you can buy it. I think you can actually buy as many as you want at one time. I think there's like a, it's like one, three, five, and then like a fill in the blank. So if you want okay. to buy like 10 or something, you can do that. And then you would be donating $30 towards the show. Yeah. But if they did three, you could get a Starbucks coffee. <laughs> True. <laughs> Subscribe to that. to the uh, yeah. <laughs> fan club. I get a Starbucks coffee and you get a shout out on the show. It all works out, (laughs) I guess. (laughs) Perfect. Thanks for listening. As always, Josh, thanks for being here. Appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, For those of you watching this on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, enable notifications, always on and drop in the comments and let us know, would you like to see more unique crossover episodes like this not with like me and josh this is inevitable but these times were like <laughs> hey these the- theologians they're actually ministering at the same time let's see 
what do they have to say about this same subject? Drop in the comments and let me know if that is a topic and if you know of theologians that you would like to see compared. Next week on the show, it's the big one, folks. The one that you have been waiting for. It's going to be my review of Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We're going to talk about the whole book in its entirety. It's a really short book. Mm -hmm. so, So looking forward to that one. Thanks again for listening. This is Brandon signing off, reminding you as always that theology is for everyone. So keep on studying.